So we meet again. Matthew, it's great to be with you, as always. We've, uh, I was just thinking backstage, all the different cities we've been in, and he'll, I think this is the furthest north in the world we've ever been together, but, uh, but it's been an amazing journey uh, with, with you, Scott, and, and NEA. Well, thank you, Matthew, and welcome to Helsinki. I've been here before at Slush. Great to be back. Um, you know, since I was here, Cloudflare has become one of the most famous companies in the world, but for the founders out there, I'd just love for you to tell them the origin story, how, how the company got started, why you started the company, what you set out to do, and, and how it's different today than what you thought it might be back then. Yeah, so um, Cloudflare launched in September of, of 2010 and actually launched an event that's a lot like Slush. It was the TechCrunch Disrupt event in San Francisco. Uh, and so when I see things like the Slush 100 and the startup competition here, you know, it's, it's amazing to think that not that long ago, just 12 years ago, we were one of those startups standing on stage, scared to death, mm -hmm. uh, pitching to a bunch of investors. And so it's, uh, it's incredible to see what's here. And, and I, I think that there's a real chance that people here might, might create, you know, the next Cloudflare, which is exciting. We started because we saw that the world was shifting from you know, software and hardware that you bought to services in the cloud that you consumed. And we saw what was happening with traditional box software, which really in the past was made by three major companies, Oracle, SAP, and Microsoft. That was turning into all the SaaS companies that are out there. We saw what was happening to the storage and compute space uh, with, uh, you know, once upon a time you would buy a box from a Dell or an HP or a Sun or an IBM, and that obviously has turned into the major cloud hosting providers. And we said that same trend is going to shift what, how people consume network gear, uh, things that someone like a Cisco would sell uh, into a service as well, and could we take advantage of that opportunity. And so the three of us that started the company, me, my co-founder Michelle, and, and Lee Holloway, um, we sort of started out thinking we're going to take on that challenge. And you know, Cloudflare's mission today is to help build a better internet. When we started, Cloudflare's mission was to build a big business and hopefully make a bunch of money. But I think what changed along the way is that in order for us to get customers we knew that we needed to have the data to build the security sets and things that the big customers that rely on Cloudflare today have. But in order to get that data, we had to have customers. And that created this chicken and egg problem where we were trying to figure out how to solve it. And the way we ended up solving it is we created a free version of our service. And we thought you know, small businesses and startups would, would sign up for that. But what really ended up being the things that signed up were a lot of the civil society organizations, nonprofits, human rights groups around the world. And um, they would get attacked all the time for the important work that they were doing. And that was, first of all, a great source of data that we could then turn around and, and use to help protect big companies. But even more important than that, I think it put us on the front lines of what were some of the most important work that was being done online and on the internet. And I think th that our mission emerged from that because we saw you know, journalists in Africa reporting on government corruption. We saw uh, human rights workers in Asia reporting on you know, the lack of hospital care. We saw you know, on the front lines today, um, you know, we're helping protect a lot of Ukraine against the attacks that are coming. And I think because we did that, it really changed the business where, yes, obviously we want to build a successful business, but our mission is much bigger than that, and it's about how do we actually help the internet and some of the most vulnerable people on the internet make sure that they're fast, reliable, and secure. And so I think our mission actually grew out of our business model, and I think that's part of why it's been so sustainable. Hmm. And, and tell us a little bit more about this idea of giving it away for free. I mean, back in the day, that, that wasn't such a universally adopted idea. And of course, today, a lot of founders are doing that. Um, so I think it'd be helpful to just reflect on not just why you did it, but how that has transformed the business and what advice you would have for entrepreneurs that are thinking about that today. You know, for us, for a lot of businesses, um, and, and, and I don't mean to, 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 to denigrate them in any way, but you know, if you're Dropbox, the reason you give the service away for free is because you hope that people will use it a bunch and, and then eventually pay you. If you're Slack, 
you hope that people will use it a bunch and eventually pay you. That's just never been the way we've thought about the business as much. Mm. What we really, the, the problem that we were trying to solve was that, again, in order for Cloudflare to be able to sell to the huge companies that rely on us today, and 18 of the 20 largest companies in the world rely on us, 32% of the Fortune 500 relies on us, or something like between 20 and 25% of the entire web sits behind Cloudflare's network today. Um, but in order to be able to get there, we knew that we needed to have the understanding of what cyber threats were out there in order to be able to stop them. And so how we catalyzed that was we, we actually gave the service away for free in order to learn about those, those cyber attacks so that we could eventually sell to the you know, Visas and Apples and Goldman Sachs and you know, big companies that, that provide most of our revenue today. But it had these additional benefits as well. While it is very rare that if Bob's blog signs up for Cloudflare that someday Bob will you know, decide to spend a you know, million dollars to protect his blog, that blog is probably still free. But what we realized was that oftentimes while Bob's blog might not be a big company, Bob is, is actually working as the CTO at somewhere like Salesforce. And, in, and that literally is how mm -hmm. Salesforce became what is a customer now that spends you know, north of $10 million a year with us. Their CTO used us on his personal blog. He got to know us there. When he went to work, he saw a problem with what was going on at work at Salesforce. He knew how we worked, and so he advocated. He became our internal champion and then pulled us into Salesforce. Salesforce started out as a $60,000 a year customer, and they've just grown and grown and grown and grown and grown. But that original seed of trust came from the fact mm. that you know, Bob, the metaphorical Bob, was using us for his personal site. And that then gave him the trust to bring us to work. So I think there are a lot of different paths that people can take with sort of the freemium um, business. I think ours is a little bit different than everyone else's. And what I think is key is you've got to understand that your business, you've got to understand um, the, the go-to-market dynamics of your business, and you've got to understand the cost of your business to make sure that if you're going to go down that path, it makes sense over the long term, but it's been something which is key to who we are and something that we, we will always have. And was that something that was easy to sell to investors in 2009 <laughs> and 2010? You know, it's, I mean, it, I think right now we are living through very difficult economic times. Um, and probably the hardest economic times since the sort of 2008, 2009 time frame. And I remember, you know, we launched in 2010, but we were first pitching investors uh, back in 2009. And, you know, we got a lot of sort of scratching our head looks when we were, when we were first pitching it. What I think we did really well, though, is we didn't pitch blindly. We didn't just go run to a bunch of investors and say anyone who who would listen to us, uh, like we're going to try and try and get money from you. We were very, very, very strategic. And this this is Michelle, my co-founder's uh, sort of the genius. Is she made a list of our target top twenty investors, not by firm but by individual partner at those firms, and we would meet with anyone. But it, was, we would, it would always be, it would never be in their office, it would never be in our office, it would all be out, always be out over coffee, we'd tell them what we were working on, we'd learn a ton from those meetings. And at some point, um, we were at one of those coffees um, with uh, a, a woman uh, named Daphina, and Daphina um, was an associate at a, a venture capital firm called Venrock, and one of the partners there was a guy named Ray Rothrock, who is one of the top security investors, and he was actually number two on our list. And Daphina said, you know, after we'd had coffee and we talked about the business, and she's like, I need you to meet Ray. And what was interesting was that was the first time that we went, when somebody was like, I can give you a clear path to one of the people on your list. We went in, we met Ray, and uh, 15 minutes in the conversation, Ray said, I have the authority to write you a half million dollar check right now. Will you take it? And I said, no. <laughs> and... And Michelle kicked me under the table, like, what are you doing? I said, well, we're, we're targeting raising $2 million, and so we need, we need more than that. And he said, well, I, then I guess we have to have you meet with the rest of the partnership. But that obviously, and that was really the only firm that we pitched um, at, at the time. And we were the only technology investment that NEA did in... Venrock. Excuse me, I, excuse me, that Venrock did... Uh, in 2009, and we and we were the, then have been the most successful 
uh, investment in Venrock's entire history, which is pretty amazing given they were the original funding behind Intel, they were the original funding behind Apple, and um, and, and so you know it's it's um, I think even in really tough times you can actually build great companies, and it becomes a little bit harder to raise money, but sometimes that actually makes the company better. Well, Ray, of course, is the one that introduced me to you, so yes. that's how we got involved. But I guess the part of what I remember also is that free wasn't so obvious back then, and while Ray and I believed in free, when we went out to raise future rounds even, it was still not that easy to find people who did believe in free. Ultimately, we found USV, and off we went. But I... Yeah. I just think that's important to think about in times like today where investors are increasingly focused on revenue generation. Yep. I certainly see that in our founders. If we encourage them to do something, you know, pursue this free strategy, their first you know, response is, well, but we're going to have to generate revenue in order to get the next round of investment, which is, I think, what you guys told us when we encourage you to go f free for longer and longer. And yeah, I know. And I think that... Um what, what, if you're going to go down that path, again, what I think you have to be incredibly disciplined about is cost. Mm. And so we have, you know, we believe that even today as a public company, every dollar that an investor tr entrusts with us is, we have a sacred duty to make sure that we are being very, very, very responsible with every single one of those dollars. And so we have, from the earliest days, obsessed about how can we drive every cost down as far as we possibly can. And I think that that discipline that was actually born out of what were the tough times when Cloudflare started has made us a much better company today. And I think the companies that launch, if you look at when do the... Googles and, and Facebooks and I mean and all of these companies that turn into massive, massive, massive successes, oftentimes they actually come out of very difficult times. Mm -hmm. And so while right now it definitely has become a lot harder than it was a year ago to raise money, I would I would bet on the companies that are that are successfully raising money today that are thinking about costs in a very disciplined way. And, and that are building businesses that, yeah, will scale to, you know, today Cloudflare, you know, generates a billion dollars in revenue, um, but that they also are doing it in a way that they can have, you know, very high margins, that they can be, that they can succeed at scale. And I think when money is really easy to come by, sometimes there's less discipline around that. And I think that the tough times that we started in actually gave us that discipline, which continues to pay off today. Well, I actually think this is one of the most important things for founders to understand about the environment we're in. You know, we know that great companies are founded and funded in really difficult times. And in, you know, in NAA's history, more than half of our best investments were companies founded in tough times. Yep. But it's precisely what you said. It's not, it's not just that the money is hard to come by, but there's sort of this crucible of learning and discipline that comes out of that, which, which builds fundamentally better businesses. And I would have to say, of all the companies I've been involved in, you're, you're right up there with Christian Chabot in terms of discipline on spending money. He's the founder of Tableau. Um, built his business on $1.8 million. That's pretty much impossible to do. But anyway, y you guys are right there with him. And one of the things I remember about that is that whenever you would encounter a problem, you would always challenge the team to solve that problem by you know, basically writing software that would solve that problem rather than going out and buying somebody's box. At one point, we had some other NEA portfolio company I remember recommending to you, which had some next generation switch or something, and you guys were nice enough to look at it, but you said, no, 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 we gotta, we gotta create the solution ourselves. Yeah, you know, I think we, you know, it, Cloudflare was either gonna be a one or a zero. It was either gonna work or it was gonna be a complete failure. And in order for it to work, it needed to have scale and or if it was going to get scale, we, we really did need to drive the fundamental costs as far down as possible. And, um, and so I think that we're, we, we invent a lot of our own solutions. Um, and, and I think you can make a mistake as a company if, you know, if, if we were inventing our own, I don't know, CRM system or we were inventing our own you know, tax and accounting system. Those aren't things that are core to our business. And we go out and buy those and we negotiate really hard on all of those things. But... Anything which is core to our business, we always needed to figure out how to do it as efficiently as possible. And so what, what I always would say to our team was, you know, let's 
drive anything which is a commodity that we're buying, it has to, we have to be able to buy it as cheaply as anyone else. Like cheaper than Google, cheaper than Amazon, cheaper than Microsoft, cheaper than, than Facebook. How do we drive those costs down? But those things that are truly differentiated, which ultimately are the people, how do you make sure that you're, you're not being cheap in those areas and that you're really rewarding people and making sure that, it is, that they are successful? And, and I'll say that um, you know, we, we've, we've done very, very well. I've, you know, from a financial perspective, done really well. But when I think about what are the things that have been the most rewarding at Cloudflare, it's when you know, an employee who is early with us calls me up and says, you know, I was just able to buy my first house because I, you know, I joined Cloudflare. I was just, you know, able to, you know, send my kids to school without having to think about, you know, what the cost would be. I was just able to do those things. And, and so I think we've always been, uh, and I think you've really helped us think through how to reward the employees and your team as much as possible. They're not commodities. That's not the place to be cheap. But yeah, driving down the cost of a switch, it's a switch. Like we should, we should make sure that we're never dependent on any one company so that we can continue to drive those costs down as far as possible. That's the commodity that you need to be cheap around. But people, you really want to reward and you want to make sure that those people who bet on you early are, are you know, in, in our cases, it, many of them created generational wealth for them, which, is, which I'm really proud of. It's wonderful to see. You know, coming back to the cost discipline, I think one of the things that impressed me was the creativity that went into the standardization of the hardware, yep. you know, off-the-shelf hardware, standardized offerings, standardized software, which could be deployed without a human ever leaving, you know, San Francisco to deploy it in Bombay or whatever it was. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Because I'm not sure people have realized that's even possible. So one of the earliest fights that we had in our engineering team at Cloudflare was did we need to have specialized hardware to do all the different things we did? So did you need a storage server to store files? And then did you need a you know, specific DDoS mitigation server to stop DDoS attacks and a DNS server? And, and that was one approach. Um, I think Lee, who was really the technical genius um, behind Cloudflare, and, and then to a lesser extent, I really saw what Google had done uh, in terms of saying, we're going to buy just commodity equipment, and then we'll spend our time writing clever software that makes it act as if it is one giant mainframe. Our question was, could we do the same thing, but instead of being one giant mainframe, could we make it one giant, you know, router or switch or load balancer, one giant network effectively uh, that was out there. And so it was not popular at the time. And it was harder, mm -hmm. but we from the beginning said we are only buying one type of server. And it has to do everything. And to the, today, we will set up, and we're on our 12th generation of servers. We buy them. We actually have multiple uh, uh, what are called ODMs that build them for us, mostly in Asia. Uh, we bid them all off each other. They have a certain spec. We're specking it down to the individual chips that are on the motherboard. Um, there are times where someone can't get a chip for us, and we'll go source the chips individually uh, to be able to, to, again, drive those costs down as far as we can. But when we buy equipment, instead of us buying you know, a little bit of one thing, a little bit of another thing, a little bit of that, we're buying a ton of one type of equipment. And that has two meaningful impacts. The first is because we can then buy at scale, we can get that equipment very inexpensively. The second is that it really simplifies our deployment so that whenever we need equipment somewhere, we can actually depot it around the world mm. and then deliver it right to those places. What's been powerful though is what that means is we're always at somewhere on our network we have a little bit too little capacity for something. Maybe we have, we're running hot on CPU, but maybe we have then an excess of something else. Maybe we have more storage than we might need. And every single quarter, our infrastructure team meets with our product team, and they look at, OK, not where are things running hot. We know what to do when things are running hot. We deploy more equipment, and we solve that. But where do we have excess capacity? And so, for example, recently, about a year and a half ago, our team looked out at our network and said, we've deployed all these servers everywhere. They have a certain amount of storage in all of them. We have excess storage today. So what can we do with that? And, and our 
infrastructure team challenged our product team to go out and build something around it. And they said, well, let's go compete with AWS, right? They have S3 as a storage system. We've got a whole bunch of extra storage. We can go sell that extra storage, which is already deployed as, a, as an object store. So we launched something called R2, which is a S3 compatible object store, but with no egress fees, no, no uh, data transfer fees. And that's going to use up all of that extra storage. And then we'll have to buy more boxes and then the, you know, to, to supply that. And then we'll wake up, I would predict, in 18 months, and now we'll have a whole bunch of extra CPU, and we'll be like, well, what can we do with that? And so I think we're always trying to think about where is there slack in the system, hmm. and how can we take that up with new products or features, which can then surprise and delight our customers. Or, you know, I, I have always really admired Amazon's ability to take things that are costs and turn them into revenue centers. And I think that we've been very inspired by that. And I think that's a, a big piece of how we think about products as we build them. Awesome, Matthew. In the time we have left, let's switch to people. Yeah. You know, I, I've been amazed over the last you know, decade I've been involved in the company that Cloudflare always seems to get the people that you want to get. And they're often quite extraordinary. And I contrast that with, you know, not that my other portfolio companies are necessarily doing a bad job of this, but it's, it's been a very difficult hiring environment for, for the last decade in Silicon Valley. What's the secret sauce at Cloudflare for you know, attracting and retaining these extraordinary people? Everyone who comes and works at Cloudflare can work somewhere else. Everyone has multiple job offers that they can work somewhere else. And we, um, I think we're generous around pay and, and mm -hmm. those things, but, but we don't chase that when, especially uh, late last year, beginning of this year, it seemed like you know, salaries were going through the roof. I think we were very disciplined around that. Um, but as a result, I think we've tried to be very fair across that. And, and people want to work for organizations that are fair. That's, I think, really important. And, and so being disciplined around how you think about compensation um, actually may mean you don't get someone um, in the short term, but it actually means that you're going to be more fair and that's more stable over the long term, which, which is important. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing is mission really matters. Um, and people who can have multiple different opportunities are thinking about what is the thing they want to do in their life. Because they realize, especially I think during COVID, people realized like time is finite and I, and I should be working on the things that really matter. And so I think that because we have a big mission, because we live that mission every day of helping build a better internet, Mm -hmm. Because we are out there, you know, right now we're helping make sure the internet stays on in Iran. We're helping, um, you know, Russian citizens, 10% of Russian households are using Cloudflare technology to bypass uh, Russian censorship. I was personally sanctioned um, by Iran. I had to check on the flight path to make sure on the way in we weren't getting too close, not by Iran, by uh, Russia, to make sure we weren't getting too close to Russia because we're pretty close right now. Um, and... Uh, and I think that people want to work for places that are doing work that matters. And so, I mean, my advice to founders that are out there, oftentimes founders want to do something that's within sort of the four corners that they understand and feel like they can control. We had no idea how Cloudflare was going to work when we started. We <laughs> saw a big problem. We're like, yeah, that seems like it's an opportunity. But we, we weren't the obvious people to figure that out, but we knew that if we got different people with different backgrounds together and that they were smart uh, and curious and empathetic, that we'd be able to figure out a big problem. And so my advice to founders is always, set your sight on something that's so much bigger than you think it is. Be serious about getting there and that's gonna help you actually attract better, better founders that's gonna make it more likely that you succeed. Love that, Matthew. Thank you. Let's leave it there. And thanks to everybody in the audience for being with us today. Thank you, sir.